I'm not a big birthday celebrator. I'm not the type to make a big thing and invite all my friends out or throw a party. My close friends know this, so usually I'll do something more low-key with my family or close friends. One year in particular, after I went to dinner with my family, three of my friends were texting me trying to make plans to go out and do something. Not out to bars or anything, we were only 19 at the time and didn't have fake IDs. My friend Jay has a Jeep, so he suggested we go night off-roading on one of the trails about a half hour from our houses. It was this really huge state park that had trails big enough to off-road on. He had done it before. Technically, you're not allowed to, but past dark, nobody's in those woods. Since my birthday's in July, the days are really long. It doesn't get pitch black until around 9 o'clock, and I'd say that was around the time we started heading over to the park. My friend Carl brought a bunch of weed, and my other friend Joey brought a handle of vodka to celebrate my birthday. The plan was to hotbox the car in the middle of the woods and just get really fucked up. Jay wouldn't be partaking in the alcohol since he was driving. So past a certain hour, the entrance to the state park's parking lot would be coned off. But since there's no night security guards, it's easy to just get out and move one of the cones and drive around it. We just were on the lookout for any cops before entering the parking lot. Once we passed the entrance, there was a somewhat long stretch of a narrow one-way road with woods on either side. And then eventually it led to the big open parking lot, which also was surrounded by woods on three sides and then baseball fields and a playground on another. Jay knew exactly where to go to get to the trails, which were technically for walking, but they were plenty wide enough to drive on according to him. We made sure there were no cops sitting in the parking lot before entering the trail though. Once we were on the trail, Jay turned his brights on to have better visibility. Some parts of the trail were definitely very bumpy and tight, where he'd have to drive slowly to be sure not to scrape any trees or bushes on either side. The trails were not made for cars after all, so caution was necessary. But it was definitely fun at first, where the trail would open up, where there would be drops. The bumpiness of the ride made it fun, almost like an amusement park ride. Carl lit up the joint he rolled and started passing it around. When we were deep enough into the trails, Jay stopped the engine and turned off the headlights. We sat in the car with the music playing and the bottle being passed around. The music was pretty loud too, so when all of us thought we heard something from outside, we genuinely went silent and looked at each other. Jay turned off the music, and we all said basically at the same time, what was that, or did you guys hear that? We all agreed it sounded like a high-pitched screaming. Jay turned the headlights back on, but we didn't see anyone in front of us. Still, we wanted to move out of that immediate spot, so he drove a little further down the trail. Once we stopped again, we agreed it might have been a female fox we heard. From here on, we hung out with the music a bit lower, and we were just chilling making mixed drinks. At one point, my friends all sang me happy birthday really loudly as a joke. Eventually, I had to go pee, so I just got out of the car and took a few steps off the trail into the woods. Midstream, I heard what I swore were footsteps nearby. I cut it short and went back into the car, telling my friends I heard footsteps. Jay turned on his headlights again, and he and I being in the front seats were the first ones to scream when we saw somebody standing about 10 feet in front of the car on the side of the trail. It was a woman with her hood up. We expected her to do something, but she just stood there. Jay rolled down his window and asked, You all right? The woman then backed slowly into the woods until she was out of sight. It was at this moment that Carl, in the back, somehow while zonked out of his mind, noticed something horrifying. I still remember the moment he said, Guys, we're surrounded. <coughs> and all of us started looking around in the woods, and there had to be at least three other people dressed in sweaters with the hoods up on different sides of the car, all looking at the car though. Mind you, this was not a cold night, it was the middle of July. They were all standing right off the trail in the woods. Carl in the back seat screamed, causing us to turn around and see a man standing right outside the back windshield looking in. The red glow from the taillights created this creepy red glow in the guy's deadpan expression. I screamed, get us out of here, just go, and Jay listened. He put the car in drive and went as fast as he possibly could over the various rocks and bumps in the trail. We were all freaking out, and the way off that trail took way too long. But when we finally reached the pavement again through another exit of the dirt trails, I know we were all relieved. Jay, the most sober out of all of us, told the rest of us who were either drunk or really high that we're going straight home. We've thought about whether those people were just a group of young adults hanging out deep in the woods like we were, but it wouldn't explain all of them just creepily staring at us, standing still. 
nor would it explain one of them standing directly outside the back windshield looking inside the car, or the fact that they were all wearing hoodies on a summer night. We also realized that scream type noise we heard most likely wasn't a fox after all, and probably had something to do with them. Either way, off-roading in those woods at nighttime was never an idea we floated again. I'll never forget my little sister's fifth birthday, but not for a positive reason. It was at a tea room type place that did princess parties for kids' birthdays. I didn't want to participate in any of the activities or princess interactions since I was worried about people thinking I was a baby, like a typical tough sixth grader. Instead, I was playing on my DS in a chair in the hallway when a random woman approached me and asked, hey, you're Gloria's kid, right? Gloria is my mom's name, so I told her, yeah, this lady tells me that she's my Aunt Sarah and that I was probably too little to remember the last time we saw each other. She started talking about how big I had gotten and asked how I was doing in school. I was pretty used to these kinds of interactions with relatives, so I didn't question it at all and gave the usual answers. Sarah then told me that she brought a large dollhouse as a birthday present and needed help carrying it out of her car. She told me that she also had brought another cake and offered me the first slice if I helped her. I was almost 12, so I was taught about creeps and the fact that this was an almost textbook kidnapping scenario. But like I said, these kinds of interactions were super common in my family. I also admit that I made the mistake of trusting Sarah more because she was a woman. So I agreed to help and followed Sarah out the back door. The car wasn't parked. It was still running with a man in the driver's seat. Sarah could tell that the man being there made me suspicious, so she quickly told me that that was my uncle Dennis and started urging me to hurry with the dollhouse before the cake frosting melted. I got a bad gut feeling. Why hadn't she asked Dennis to help her carry the dollhouse in? And why did they keep the car running when there was plenty of empty spots to park in? I stood where I was and refused to move. Sarah's tone became much less friendly as she was now commanding me to come to the car. Sarah tried to tug my jacket sleeve, but I swatted her hand away and yelled at her to stop. She looked furious. And for a second, I thought Dennis was about to step out of the car. Thankfully, we all heard my mom and aunt loudly yelling my name. Sarah jumped in the car, and she and Dennis both took off. I ran through the back door and met my mom and aunt halfway inside. I immediately told them what happened. My mom hugged me and told me she was so sorry and that everything would be okay, while my aunt told the tea room workers. They basically put the tea room into lockdown and had all the kids gather in one room to make sure no one else had gone missing. Thankfully, no one had. The police eventually came to speak to me about what had happened. I told them as much as I could about Sarah and Dennis. The police officers I spoke to promised me that they would get back to me and my mom if they found out anything new, but we never heard anything back from the police about Sarah or Dennis, or whatever their real names were. As far as we know, they've never been caught. I still have no idea how Sarah knew my mom's name. I just try to be grateful that I'm okay and avoid thinking about what would have happened to me if I hadn't listened to my gut and had followed Sarah to the trunk of her car. My uncle is really well off and has a really cool house on the water with a huge backyard and pool. So for my 21st birthday, he let me use the backyard to throw a big party since he was out of town for the month anyway. Since it was my 21st and I wanted to go crazy, I invited all my friends and told them to invite all of their friends, just as long as they bring their own beer. The party started at 8. My uncle had a surround sound speaker system in the yard that was perfect for parties. I just plugged my burner phone in and put on a music mix that was good for parties. I told everyone that I invited to stay out of the house though unless they were going to the bathroom. It was strictly a backyard party. I quickly realized there were more people than I was anticipating. Almost all of my friends who I invited showed up, with extra people accompanying them. And then on top of that, people I didn't even recognize were walking in groups together through the gates. I had to assume everyone here was invited by people who I invited. But when there were easily more than 80 people in the backyard, I started getting anxiety about the cleanup and potential damage I'd find tomorrow. I tried my best to keep an eye on who was going in and out of the house. It was a long night though, and being the birthday guy, I did get distracted often. The party got way more crowded before it started to slow down, and eventually police came and shut down the party because multiple neighbors complained, so I had to tell everyone to leave except for a select group of my friends. 
There were about 10 of us left outside by the pool, and these numbers dwindled down until it was just myself and my friend Rob. My uncle told me I can't have anyone sleep over, but honestly I didn't think it would hurt if only Rob stayed over. He was blackout drunk anyway, and would easily just pass out on the couch. I walked him inside, then went back outside to lock both gates, then locked the back door. By the time I got inside, Rob was already sprawled out on the couch in the living room, and any time I'd attempt to talk to him asking if he's asleep already, he'd just make a half-effort groan sound. So I left him there. I checked the bathroom to make sure it wasn't too dirty, and minus a couple empty beer cans on the counter, it wasn't bad. The cleanup wasn't going to be too bad tomorrow with the help of Rob. I went upstairs planning to sleep in one of the many bedrooms, wondering why my uncle was so strict with no one staying over when there's literally four extra beds. The two fancy stairways in the giant foyer led up to an upstairs balcony that overlooks the foyer, and then a bunch of bedrooms and two bathrooms and another living area. I brushed my teeth with my finger in the upstairs bathroom and went right to sleep. I was drunk too, so I fell asleep with ease. I woke up about an hour later feeling really nauseous. I mixed way too many liquors. I had to run to the toilet to puke. After I puked, I walked back out into the upstairs balcony area and I heard footsteps from down in the foyer. I walked over to the railing of the foyer balcony and looked down. I said, Rob, and I saw a figure in the darkness below stop moving. I felt like I could see them looking up at me, but with how dark it was in the house, I couldn't see the person's face or any features. I then heard something from the living room downstairs. The sound of snoring. It just dawned on me that the person in the foyer wasn't Rob. I said, who is that? Thinking maybe it was just another party guest who maybe passed out somewhere drunk earlier. But they didn't answer. I heard more footsteps from the kitchen area downstairs. My heart started pounding now. I said, I'm going back to sleep, pretending like I thought they were just party guests when in reality I was going back to the bedroom to lock the door and call 911 right away. But then I remembered Rob was down there. I had to try to warn him. I called his number and someone picked up. Before saying anything, I said Rob at least three times. All I heard was breathing on the other end. I hung up the phone and dialed 911 now. And while on the phone and whispering to the 911 operator, the door knob to the door twisted around and then there was a light knock on the door. I asked the operator in a whisper if I should say I'm on the phone with the police, and he said no, don't announce my presence. I asked what about my friend Rob, and he paused for a second as if he didn't know what to tell me. Then he said just wait in the room until police arrive. If they think my friend is asleep, they probably wouldn't harm him. I could tell even the operator didn't really know what to do about that, but I figured that was the best option too. At this point, all I could do was wait in the locked room, waiting out the intruders until the police got there. The operator told me police were arriving now, and that they would try the front and back doors. The police were able to enter through the back door which was left open by whoever the intruders were. Only then was I instructed to go downstairs and meet them. I woke up Rob and explained everything to the police while he listened, still drunk and confused. I searched the house seeing if anything was missing, but it wasn't my house so I didn't really know what was there beforehand. My uncle's bedroom was locked, and he didn't have many valuables just sitting out in the open. The police searched the entire house before leaving. They said they'd keep an officer on the block for the night, which made me feel a little better. I never told my uncle about this until one day, he asked where his Cartier watch was. Apparently it was stolen right from the kitchen drawer by one of the intruders. It was then that I had to tell him the truth, and obviously he was anything but happy. He never asked me to reimburse him for the watch, but he also never allowed me to throw any kinds of events at his house again, and I can't blame him for that.